welcome. Welcome to another episode of Ditto Driving IT Topics Online. The trilogy is here. I'm going with the try stuff again, but that's trilogy. The trilogy is here. So I got Farouk. How are you doing? Hey, I'm all about the trifecta. I like shooting threes. So hey. ditto. All right. Kim, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm doing just fine. Doing just fine. She's had a long also day. happy to be part of the trifecta. We've all had a long day, I think. <laughs> yeah, we were sitting here like trying to figure out what the topic was. That's how well organized these project managers are. We're sitting there like, hey, what should we talk about? Oh, we our, to the box. our projects are in good shape, but our podcast selection of, of stuff is not so good. Because we're prioritizing, right? That's right. We, right. <laughs> we know what's important. All right, Farouk, or yeah, why don't you set this one up, Farouk? We let Kim do last one, so. Yeah, no, it's all good. And so, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot in any project, projects bring, one of the biggest things that a project can bring is change. And when you're trying to bring change, there are a lot of factors that you need to incorporate into the process of change management. If you don't consider change management an integral part of the initial part of your project, you're going to end up with a whole lot of frustrated people throughout your project. And you might not even achieve, you know, project acceptance where people say, Hey, look, this project was successful. So you, what you measure might hit the mark as far as like we check all the blocks, but ultimately if you don't go through, you know, a meticulous process of developing a change management plan, which doesn't necessarily mean you got a whole bunch of stuff documented. It just means that you have laid out, some key tasks along the way that incorporate all the components necessary for people to understand, for, for people to know what the change is. And it's not like a big change, like, oh, we're changing out a system. There's a lot of other things that have to change with that. And, you know, just starting that process early and often and, and exercise early and often is really important. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Yeah, no, I think it changes one of those things that we, we were chatting just a little bit before that changes one of those things where, I'm going to make a statement here and it's probably going to anger some people, but I don't think people really like change. I think, I think there's a lot of people out there that just do not like change. They like how things are running and how things are going. But then, so they, they, I think they become the, the roadblocks in, in change, but then when the change finally gets there, they're like, wow, this is great. We should have done this long ago. So they like, they flip flop on you. Um, but yet you go into it again and they're they're again against change again. They start out in that same pattern again. Yeah, I agree. I think um, one of the things that I that I, I say often is it's one of the most dangerous places to be is complacency, uh, especially in our industry, right? We're, we're IT project managers and, and IT is all change. We're agile. It's just there's consistent change. Every, every day is a, is a different day for us. Um, but people get very complacent and they like to, to stay in their lane. And, and, but you can't make progress in certain industries or in certain projects if um, you're not making the change. Yeah. And when I look at change, you know, I, I think about like the way that we talk about like continuous process improvement or continuous improvement, whatever the vernacular you want to use nowadays. At the end of the day, change requires you to, I tell people to, be uncomfortable, be comfortable with being uncomfortable. Like if you get yourself to that complacency standpoint, like if you get yourself to the point where you're very comfortable, everything is going nice and simple and straightforward, you are not looking for opportunities to improve, which is part of change. So I don't think it's about upsetting people, Brian. Ultimately, that's just human nature. Human nature is to to resist change. You don't want to wake up in a different bed every single morning of your life. You don't, I don't wanna, mind that. I don't mind that. I'll so do that. You, so if you woke up and you were in a different city, I mean, in a Tim's different expression city. on her face is priceless. And I, uh, but you too bad you guys can't all see that. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, people crave consistency. People yeah. crave a pattern. You know, I want to get up. I want to drink my coffee. I want to go do this thing. You tell people they got to get up and put a, fix a hole in the wall or the next day they got to put the shoes on because it's water under. Like it just, that's what creates that funny word stress. But where people are feeling like, hey, look, you've disrupted my, my apple cart, you know? Now, do you think with everybody like working at home and having that, you know, the, the, the recent, obviously, COVID stuff going on when people are working at home and working remotely, that they're, that change affected them? Or do you think they found that 
it becomes it allows them to be more flexible. And I, I certainly have an opinion on, on on working from home versus working from an office. But I just wondered what your thoughts, you guys' thoughts are on that because that was a big change for a lot of people. Kim. I actually worked from home before all of the pandemic. So for me, it was not actually a very big uh, change as far as work goes. But I do know a lot of other folks who impacted them severely, uh, especially, you know, if they had kids or their um, other other things where they didn't have a, an area where they could just focus only on work. Now, they still tried to hold their other home responsibilities at the same time and uh, also became complacent. And then now I know of people who are so comfortable working from home. They don't want to go back into the office now that they're used to being at home. I don't want to, I don't want to, I like working in my pajamas. Yeah. So, you know, pros and cons, pros and cons. That's well, you think. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things I think about is, so, you know, we talk about some personal change and we talk about some personal things that we change, but let's talk about change about projects. Cause you know, everybody's going to be expecting us to stay on the PMP track. So Absolutely. When I think about change and when I think about project, when does when do you start the process of change management? What's what is that? What's the tip? What's the kickoff for that that element? I, for me personally, it's got to start even before the kickoff of the project. I mean, the discussions, the understanding that change is coming, has got to be out there. The communication about change is coming has got to be out there. It's almost a pre-sell uh, for the project coming out there, especially if it hits a lot of people. I used to work in a uh, in a retail situation before we replaced our front end retail oh. systems. And we started, I think probably even two to three months before the project even started, it was still an approval process where we were starting to, we had gotten the initial nod to say, yes, let's go forward. We had already started with managing change and understanding what that's going to do to a, a ton of people because it was our front end system. Plus it included, you know, all the IT folks that were supporting it and everybody in between. Um, so we, we started with communications very, very early on that one, way before we even started the project. Kim? I mean, I think for existing projects, just any change to your baseline, obviously you're going to have to submit some type of change request, right? That's a huge part of the change. Uh, change management. Um, and then, you know, if your quality is going to be impacted in any way, you, that's when you also start initiating some, some change and, and you start identifying uh, the risks, the benefits and the impacts that it'll make on your project going forward. I think about like, what is, what is the, so you talk, you all talked about some very, I would say some formal aspects of it. But so if you do a formal aspects of it, like, how do you, ensure that process so there's a socialization there's these briefings these, these notifications like what do you what do you codify this do you you know is this where do you document this information so that people actually take steps to do the actual process of change management where do you, where do you get that well a lot of times it, it, formal there is a formal process right there's a change request process uh, it's something stimulates the need for the change whether it's because it's going to uh, be a benefit in its optimization to the, the project or if it's uh, risk mitigation right uh, and then the formal process is usually like you know for for some it's going through a cab and then a ccb right usually there's just some type of, of change control board uh, there's always a group. Somebody's got to approve it before that can even be implemented. And at that time, that's when you have other stakeholders chiming in and they get their opportunity to determine whether that's the best way forward and how that will impact uh, everything on a, on a more macro level. And then if that is approved, uh, then it's communicated that it's been approved and when it's going to be. And usually, I would say the formal way is to send out the, no the notification to all stakeholders and users. Um, Brian? Yeah, so um, just to backtrack it just a second. Uh, Kim mentioned CAB, which is a change advisory board if for folks that don't know what that is. And what we do um, in our projects is we have a change advisory board. So they meet and we discuss the change. We submit a formal change request and they discuss the change and advise us on it before we hit CCB, change control board, as to how to either update the change, uh, provide more information, provide a deeper look into what it is, something that might be missing in there. So they advise you on how to ensure that when you get to CCB, that you've got a good solid case of what you need to do to make the change and it should be an easier process through ccb so i think you know just want to describe that process as well because i've been in other companies where it's ccb right away you go into it you get denied the first one you have to go back to a second one and it's just kind of a waste of time i like the idea of a, a cab first and then a ccb second 
So when I think about, you know, change, you know, you all talked about a very formal aspect of it. I'm, I'm thinking about like the informal aspect of the socialization. And I, I think a lot of people I've noticed in my career are really terrible at socialization. I mean, I'm, I'm just gonna say it because it requires you to have a lot of conversations with maybe people that are very senior and or mid-tier managers or people that have influence, influencing stakeholders that can actually impact the success of your project. So it's like getting a slide or just having, making time, going and sitting and and getting their feedback before you try to put the change up and request it, you know, in a formal process. Because honestly, if you do your homework correctly, I feel like you a lot of times find out what all your pitfalls are, what all your, you know, contrarians are going to say. If they do it, you know, if you give them that time and you socialize, so spending that time walking around, so, so to speak, getting time with people that, you know, would have influence on the actual direction of whatever that change may be is I think a essential part of it. I don't know how y'all feel about it, but that to me is really, really critical, even more than the formal process. You know? No, I see where you're going. So it's like, it, it's kind of like that pre-sell, right? I mean, you, you, you need to find out who are behind you. In, like we've, we've all talked about this and Fruk is an innovative uh, innovation project manager. He likes those new projects and stuff. So he, I, I think you're coming from that viewpoint of there's something that, that there's, a, there's an idea that's floating out there and you need to somehow get that around that this change could be coming, right? Um, and I, and I, I agree with you, getting out there, talking to people, a couple minutes with this person, a couple minutes with that person, a couple of minutes with a person that you know is gonna be behind this just because you've worked with them before, they're gonna support this change. And then you might even talk to a couple of people that are against it to understand what the pitfalls might be so that you need to adjust your, your focus on what you're gonna do or how you're gonna do it or, or even how you're gonna communicate it just to do that. But I, yeah, I think you're right. There's, there's this whole initial informal discussions of the idea we did it with this right we did it with you did it actually with with ditto the podcast here is you you and i kind of caught something and then you kind of floated it by our executives and nothing formal at that point but it was just kind of a eh, you know how about this and thought about this and then and then we eventually got to the point where you you and i both believe that you you more than me because you were talking to them that hey this could fly let's put something formal together right and that's when you put that that formal change basically to them together and, and and to me that's what i think greasing the skids people use the term right there you go. so you grease the skids before so it's a smooth landing you know you don't you know what that greasing the skids are no go ahead what is that you don't know what that is okay so when i'm up in when i used to live in maine that wasn't too long ago we had bath ironworks which is they call it biw they make um ships for the for the navy up there and for all kinds of folks and when they have it on dry dock and before they launch it there are they're on these skids or long long like I don't know, they made a steel here and they're and they're just long pillars if you will and they grease those up um so that the boat will slide down nicely because in the past they've realized that they had they can get caught up and the boat can kick sideways a little bit and it goes down sideways it doesn't go in always nose first or, yeah and I, don't, and I don't think anybody wants their boat to go you know a brand new boat to flip over no Nope. Unless yeah, it's a submarine. That, that whole process is not, it's not cool, you know, watching the boats not slide in the water easily. So they learned to grease the kids. Go oh, ahead. Bad. No, no, go finish up. Finish up. No, I was actually watching a video earlier of a guy, he was trying to back his trailer up from, from on a boat ramp. And literally it probably took him 45 minutes to realize that he was not going to get it. And he didn't grease the skids at all because he was, <laughs> he was literally backing up and you know how you got to turn the opposite direction you want the trailer oh, to go yeah. he, just, right. he just couldn't stop getting it wrong and it was it was hilarious <laughs> but you know we digress you know, know we digress when haven't Thanks. we so you know we think we talked about change management from the perspective of like communication socialization so like when you are how do you change so a lot of times and a lot of times a lot of organizations let's just talk about organizational change when you are going through a major i'm going to talk about major organizational transformations and because i've done it been through a couple where a couple organizations where they they go through and say hey look we're going to basically like contract out a bunch of people in the organization and we're, or we're going to convert these positions to contract or convert them to civilians or whatever people start getting nervous 
how do you ensure that the rumor mill does not dominate your change management process? And, you know, because we know what the rumor mill can do to to people from that perspective. Like, how do you ensure that that you stay on key with, with how do you manage change when you have to deal with a rumor mill? Uh, I think uh, first and foremost, leadership needs to uh, have clear and concise communication in regards to those big changes, right? A lot of times, if, if there's no communication from from the very top, that's usually where it starts. That's where everyone starts questioning everything because they don't know, right? If your if your buddy next to you, your coworker is telling you how it is, you're like, oh yeah, but that doesn't that doesn't mean it's true. But if the, if your leaders are telling you that, hopefully, you know that is true. Um, so clear and concise communication from your leadership and rolling that down and making sure that it is very, being communicated clearly all the way to the, to the bottom level and having having some t- transparency there as well, right? The more you try to cover up, the more stress and anxiety that could add for, for somebody, the, the unknown, the 12 o'clock, of what, what's ahead of me, I don't know. And that, and, you know, that can cause all kinds of, of different reactions. Yeah, I would 100% agree with that. It needs to come down from the leadership and the transparency. I understand that. But... I also think you need to have ears on the street, okay? So I think you need to have yet a form of communication, the leadership carrying it, but I need, I've always liked to have ears on the street. When I may, what I mean by that is I wanna be in the rumor mill. I wanna hear what's being talked about. I wanna be a part of that so that I can address that. Um, I try to do that pretty much everywhere I am. I try to listen just on the side here and there, pick up little things that are going on, some things that aren't, you know, the, just to understand what the, what the discussions are so that if there, if it is related to a change that leadership's coming forward with or thing like that, and they've got those questions, you know, they'll have the Q and A sessions and say, "Hey, does anyone have any questions about this?" Is this, and, you know, nobody, nobody tends to say things, or so, or people don't want to say things, but then they get talked about in the rumor mill afterwards. It's always good to have ears on the street on that, and it's, it's, I, I'm not a, a tattletale. I want to make sure that the information that people are concerned about is addressed, and if it is addressed. Um, I think that leadership gets a better rap for it as well because they know that they're listening and they may have heard something from somebody and they addressed it. Yeah, from my perspective, like leader, leaders own the change management process. You own it. If you don't own it, because part of that is you got to be out there early and often and continuously. You know, you, you people go in and, you know, regardless if it's a system change, if it's a process change, if it's an organizational change, the leaders that are in the chain of command in the organizational structure, and they they have to own that, and it has to be top down. It cannot be. Gra- I, I do see value in the grassroots, you know, at ground level, but th- from my perspective, to control the messaging, to ensure that there's consistent delivery, to ensure that it fits the tone of what the organization is trying to portray, you, the leadership has to own it. And if they don't own it, and they hand it off to somebody else, I always take that as like this is about to be some bad news coming. Because they don't want to tell everybody, yeah, like, exactly. uh-oh, they, they keep handing it off to somebody else to, to, to go say, you know, this is what's going on with this. Well, if, you, if you're if really leading, you should be at the front every single time when it comes to change. So, you know. It's funny because uh, Adam and I were just actually having a conversation about this right before this conversation about um, organizational change and changing uh, system components. Uh, versus changing a system, right? Making optimizing a system versus optimizing a component, and how if if you optimize a component, right? If you're to optimize a process or a department or whatever, you, whatever that doesn't necessarily mean it will optimize the system. And so it's important for leaders to be involved at least with all of this, so that they can make sure that the changes that are happening. Um, can positively affect the dynamic of all components underneath that system and that the system it's it's meeting the strategic goal of the system and not just that minor component right I, I, think, I look at it just like a like cogs in a watch you can go you can have a, a watch that has been running for many many years right and you decide you like this one cog you decide just to, this is a parallel for what you just talked about Kim. You pull out that one cog and you clean it up and you shine it, you brush all the dust, you polish it, you grease it, and then you stick it back in the watch. <laughs> it doesn't mean the watch is going to be more on time. That's perfect. You know, it's funny as really- Adam and I were trying to think of an analogy and we could not think of one really, like a really good you one. So I'm the analogy man. Oh, you know, I'm going to analogy. 
But but things like that is situations like that that where people think, oh, I'm refining my process or I'm fixed, I'm changing this, and then they 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 forget to step back and look at the whole whole everything. And you might have optimized or you might have changed or you might have improved, but then there's a there's what we call the butterfly effect. So you know the butterfly effect of one change. And that's why you have formal CCBs and cabs and things of that nature in those processes, because you have to think about the butterfly effect. If you make this one little ripple, oh, I'm going to change this one character at the end of this string and it's everything. It's not going to be it, it'll fit within this data field that I have. But you don't know that, you know, five interfaces later, this feeds a critical component or a critical data field to pay somebody their money which is key for them to get their medication, which is key for them to prevent them from dying. And you just cut that, you cut that one character off thinking that, oh, it's not going to make a big deal. So it's, it truly is. That's what change management does. It helps mitigate risk down the line of a whole multitude of things. And if we don't take that time to think through these processes, to think about how change impacts an organization, or a system, a team, then you end up with a lot of painful you know, consequences down the line. Have you guys, either one of you worked with a change manager, like someone who's assigned to a project that actually that's their job is to, is to manage the change? Man, that's, that sounds like Mr. Pembach right there. Cause I, <laughs> I don't know any organization actually, I've ever seen that has that many people that have a change manager. In my last employer, uh, we did have a change manager. She was assigned to that. And her, her focus was all the aspects that we've been talking about right here around the organization to make sure that the change that we were making was understood, accepted, uh, not necessarily accepted, but just understood so that it can be accepted. Um, and then all the components that might touch it around to make sure that that change in itself doesn't cause the butterfly effect, like you said, but has a better effect on people. Or do we need to bring another piece of this into that organ, into this project that we have because it's going to directly affect that like you said five steps down do we have to make sure they are okay with this change it's not going to mess something up down the path Farouk? no i mean kim had something she was you about to do okay. well i've worked with a change management team um uh that was that worked with all of the different uh, projects right and uh, same concept like we would but again uh, more formal submit a CR, it go through the CCB, and that change management team would be the one looking at all of the change requests and, and making sure that um, everyone across the board or any any user that had access to that part, to any stakeholder um, had input to make sure that that wasn't going to impact uh, someone else down the road or another interface or another connection. Uh, same concept, but we had a whole team for it. And, that, so, and to me, what you just brought up, is tied to that formal process and i in my head right now when y'all were talking about this i found myself struggling because i was thinking like what are y'all talking about like pms we manage change all day long all that but i get where you're going with this because there needs when you go through that formal cr process there have to be groups of people and we have it we have it in our organization they follow up to say hey look was the change implemented did it, did it, did it create the intended outcome and that's our, you know, we have that process internally. I mean, as an organization, which which actually works where they follow up, they want to see the metrics, they want to see the process, or whatever that was, you know, how things were before and what they are now. But as a pro project manager, program manager, you're doing that all the time, right? You're doing that every, like I, I just, we just updated the schedule, you know, five minutes ago, that's change, you know, and how do you manage that change? How do you communicate that change? I had to create slides. Um, updating slides. I'm sending emails, letting people know the change is coming. Oh, we had a date that we thought we were going to be done with this, but we just changed it. Now everybody's got to know. Then you got to manage expectations because the customer is going to be upset or they're going to be happy or they're going to be ambivalent. Whatever it is, like as a project manager, you're always managing change. You're always, you live in change management, which is to me associated with risk management. So you, you, you manage the change to mitigate risk or, you know, to see, take advantage of opportunities or things of that nature. So that's kind of like how I see it from that perspective. Yeah, so like formally, like if you're talking just PMBOK change management, right? You were going through the, the formal process, it's a CR. So es essentially any change to your baseline has to go through the formal CCC, CCB process. 
uh, in order to make those changes. But the daily changes, those informal changes that you're talking about, Farouk, I think no matter what, what are the things that you, what is the information that you have to have before you implement this change, right? For example, you're collecting the risks that are involved, right? What are your risks? How are you going to mitigate those if you implement this change? What resources do you need? Who do you need? Like what, what's your, what's your plan of action? What, what does this, what will the schedule look like? Um, things like that. Like what information do you have, do you put together before you think about this change and, and present it to the stakeholders, yeah. whether it's formal or informal? Yeah. I mean, for me, I, I always start off what's the current state, you know, and then where, where's the desired end state and then how, what's all the deltas in between. So like you said, what are the resources that are required? What are the technologies, tools that are required? What processes have to be updated? What, you know, plans that are in place or, you know, what system components. So it's so many, all of those elements tie back to risk. All of those elements tie back to execution and, you know, it's, just, it's a constant cycle you know, constant cycle. I mean, literally, yeah, we change our schedule all the time. But in, on a pioneering project, that's one of the things you always are doing. You're adjusting the schedule. Why? Because there's a lot of unknown and known. So you got these other black swans or icebergs, whatever you want to call them. They are the things that are getting you in trouble and you're realizing, uh-oh, you know, this is going to take us longer. What's the ripple effect on the schedule? So you end up doing back planning sessions, forward planning sessions, risk mitigation sessions, course of action analysis, all of these different met tools and method methods to be able to try to manage change. So, I mean, yeah, I, I also, see, go ahead. Okay. I also think you need to, I don't know how to say this in a, in a formally kind of way, but keep it simple, right? Keep it simple when you're, when you're addressing the change and making sure people understand what it is. If you, inundate them with too much information like i've seen this happen before where a change is coming through and they've got well we've got this metric and this is going to change this measurement and this is how the project's going to change it those are all good things to have right those are all good things that you need to have as a project manager but if i'm displaying that to somebody else i don't want to inundate them with all that change factors that may or may not they may not may, may not care about that right so we've talked about knowing your stakeholders and knowing your audience ahead of time you know the devs if, if you're working with a dev group they may only want to need to know like am i continuing to work on the thing i'm working on do we have more stuff do we have am i changing what i'm working on right so knowing your audience so that you can help them to understand the change and accept the change quicker it, it, i think is important as well so depending on who you're talking to, you need to know what information you need to provide to them. And I, I know we've talked about that in previous podcasts too, is know your audience. I'm just going to jump in. Like when we changed and we added Kim and we became the trifecta, we had to go through change management, right? Right. Like we became the trifecta. It was a great thing. At yeah. the same time, we had to reevaluate our process. We had to figure out, we communicated with people. We had to step back and look at the way we were doing things. Our prep tactics, we'd be up at 6 a.m. And Kim is like, where's my coffee? Where's my coffee? <laughs> yeah, exactly. She doesn't move without and, coffee. And, you know, but but at the end of the day, you have to, you know, every change happens all the time. And I think that that's part of the cycle of being a PM, being able to adapt to that change. And that's the one thing that in human nature that makes us the most survivable creature. It's because we adapt well. Think about Think about COVID. We all dealt with COVID. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of people had a lot of significant impacts to their lives and their families and things of that nature. But as a human, from a human perspective, we adapted. And people are adapting to high gas prices right now. <laughs> and people are having to a housing market that has no houses available and car lots that are that people are paying for a car before they even see the car. How are we, how, when would you do that before? Oh, I'm not even going to look at the car. I'm just going to buy it. Like we continuously adapt to change, but they are normally forcing functions, similar stimuli that create that, that force. And we, you know, once again, we determine how we react or we react based on current circumstances. But at the end of the day, guess what? Change is coming. Change is always happening. Be ready for change. Yeah. So I think you nailed it right on the head and to, to, to kind of, close this out a little bit, I think, is you have to be adaptable to change and you have to also help your help your project, help your teams be adaptable, get them comfortable to be ready for moves, be ready, be agile. And I I'm, now I'm using that word like I shouldn't be using it, but be have the ability to move in. 
to to move and shake as you need to as things are coming forward. You know things are going to change, and you said it's, it's it's constant. There's a constant thing of change going on. We adapt to it. We change, and the 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 sooner folks can get understanding of being able to adapt to it and get behind a change, the better you're going to feel about it. The better it's going to happen for you, and your life gets your life improves. I'm sorry, but not, your life will improve absolutely. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, I think we've talked about we changed this. We, we need to change this topic because we need to change because we're running out of time. But what I would say is I'm incredibly happy to have you all, you know, to join you all every time we get on here because it's exciting. It's it's a great it's a great break in my day. And, uh, you know, it, it also helps people get through hope. <laughs> every time I, I like him, I like him, I like him's hump day better, you know. Now she gives us the whoop whoop. Um, there it is. Uh, <laughs> I have to laugh at that one too. So hey, just want to thank uh, Spin Sys, Spin Systems Incorporated, for allowing us to do this podcast. And um, hey, as always, awesome time with both of you. Um, we do have some some cool stuff coming up. And if you listen past the end of the podcast, you're going to hear a little sound bite that might help you understand what we're going to do here recently or coming up soon. Um, so I want to thank both Kim and Farouk. Any last words, either one of you? Happy, happy day. Happy Wednesday. All right. We're out. Continue.